We uh, are joined this morning by, uh, with Thad Allen, uh, our National Incident Commander dealing with the oil spill uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. He is also here for uh, a meeting with uh, cabinet agencies that are dealing with uh, this crisis as well that begins uh, in a little less than an hour. Uh, so let me turn it over to him to uh, walk through the stages of our response, and uh, we will both take your questions. Sir. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate it. Good morning. Uh, first, a quick uh, operational update. Uh, in the last 24 hours, uh, the production of the uh, Discover Enterprise over the wellhead produced uh, 11,000 barrels of oil. Uh, they continue to increase over the, last, the first three days of operation. We have gone from 6,000 to 11,000. Uh, trying to increase that production rate, uh, ultimately close the uh, venting valves and uh, move to a greater capacity. Uh, BP anticipates moving another craft in that can actually handle additional production. And the combination of these two, the, the vessel is actually called the Q4000. Uh, combined, uh, we'll have a production capability of about 20,000 uh, barrels a day. And we're looking to increase production, as I said, uh, so we can slowly uh, close those vents and see how the uh, containment cap is working and whether or not any oil is forced down by the pressure uh, through the rubber seals, as we've uh, talked about before. Uh, in the long run, uh, British Petroleum is also looking at uh, bringing larger uh, production vessels in, create a more permanent uh, connection that can be uh, disconnected easily in case we have a uh, hurricane or, or uh, bad weather later on in the hurricane season. And we'll continue to uh, uh, optimize uh, the production out of the well and to contain it. As I've said several occasions, though, the long-term solution to this is going to be uh, drilling the relief wells, which are again targeted at uh, early August. Uh, there are two relief wells in progress right now. Uh, development driller three uh, is down between seven and eight thousand below the sea floor. Uh, development driller uh, two is down around uh, three thousand. Those will continue. The second one is a, a risk mitigator as we move towards what will be the final solution, uh, which will be the relief wells. And following the intersection of the well bore with those relief wells. They will uh, put heavy mud down there to suppress the uh, pressure of the oil coming up from the reservoir, uh, put a cement plug in and effectively do what I would call a bottom kill as opposed to the top kill, which was uh, not successful uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what I'd like to kind of talk to you about is the uh, uh, area of operations out there. And we're gonna try something on you today. And if you like it, we'll continue to refine it. So I think this is a work in progress, but can we go and put the slide up, please? Uh, and we'll, there are copies available on the web, and we'll get it to you. But uh, basically, we're going to try and start giving you a three-dimensional look at what the world of work is like out there. And we're dealing with basically four areas of operations. One is the subsea area where we're trying to do with uh, containment on the well. The second is trying to deal with the oil that's on the surface above the well, where it it's, comes up in large quantities and can be dealt with effectively through mechanical skimming and in-situ burning. Uh, we all know about the recovery on shore, uh, but the, but the uh, emphasis over the last couple of weeks has shifted to the period, the area between the shoreline and out about 50 miles. Because what's happened over the last uh, several weeks, this spill has disaggregated itself. We're no longer dealing with a large monolithic spill. We're dealing with an aggregation of hundreds or thousands of patches of oil that are going a lot of different directions. And we've had to adapt, and we need to adapt to be able to meet that threat. Uh, when this uh, operation started, we were controlling all skimming and in situ burning operations out of the incident command post in Houma, Louisiana. Uh, which has responsibility for the area where the well is at. Uh, <clears throat> in the last week, we have shifted control of skimming assets to the commander and its incident command post in Alabama, who is responsible for Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, and actually have dis uh, d detached a task force to work for him to push out 50 miles offshore and find these smaller patches and try and deal with them before they get to shore. This is an adaptation to the changing characteristics of the spill, which is no longer a single spill, but a massive uh, collection of a smaller spills moving forward. And in regards to that, uh, what is becoming critical in the near future will be able to get a skimming capability offshore and be able to work those small patches. Uh, we've made some significant progress in bringing more folks into the fight in terms of vessels of opportunity. Uh, these are local fishing vessels and work boats uh, that we certify uh, to help us and then also certify the individuals and train them that are on. Between Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida right now, we have about 1,500 a vessel of opportunities where we've uh, certified the crews and put them out there. Uh, what we now have is an opportunity to match vessels of opportunity with skimmers. So the next uh, critical component or resource we're going to be looking for is to increase the amount of skimmers now that we have these vessels that can deploy them. Uh, we have over 100 large vessels that are skimming offshore 
in and around the surface area above the well. What we want to do is take this down to a slightly lower level, smaller skimmers and smaller vessels that can work in the harbors and the bays up to 50 miles offshore. And we're moving those assets into place right now. We'll be looking nationally at our skimmer inventory and try and get those matched up uh, with the vessels of opportunity as we move forward. Uh, we continue to move Coast Guard units in as well. Uh, we have Coast Guard cutters that have skimming capabilities stationed off of uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. We have a Coast Guard cutter out there uh, conducting command and control, have helicopters for surveillance, and we have small Coast Guard patrol boats that can actually do scouting, work with the vessels of opportunity uh, to, to identify the small patches of oil and uh, deal with it there. I would tell you this, though, uh, boom is not a silver bullet against oil. We had, a, we had a situation over the weekend where we had boom in place uh, and back behind Dolphin Island, Alabama, and the sea state actually defeated the boom, and we had some oil come ashore there and had to deal with that. We will continue uh, to, to press forward. I think we have to deal with the reality that no matter how much boom we have out there, the disaggregation of this slick is going to cause oil to come ashore from time to time. Uh, the question for us and the challenge for us is get, get quicker and agile, but smaller units can get to back, uh, back bay shallow areas and work offshore to find smaller patches of oil and deal with them as, as quickly as we can uh, moving forward. Uh, with that, I'd be glad to take any questions you might have for me. Uh, Admiral Allen, what percentage of oil do you think is being captured at this point by the uh, containment device? Well, let me give uh, uh, two answers to that, and I think we're going to have to get more fidelity on this as we get w the actual flow rate established. Uh, we have two models for flow out of the wellhead that were done by uh, our flow rate technical group under Marsha McNutt of the U.S. Geological Survey. One was a range of 12 to 19,000 barrels a day. The other one was a range of 12 to 25,000 barrels a day. We are now approaching production that will get up around 15,000 barrels a day. I think once we know the production flow, and we're able to seal off the vents and then assess the leakage around the seal, we will have a hard, fast number that will tell us where within that range uh, that flow rate lies and allow us to kind of, I would say, narrow the range from the outside and get greater fidelity. Once we do that, then we can actually back that in for the number of days the spill's been ongoing and get a better overall estimate of the overall amount of oil that's been spilled. I call it, it's kind of like an oil budget. How much is coming out, how much do we skim, how much do we burn, and then so we can account for you know where all the hydrocarbons went, and that's a work in progress right now. We'll be able to give you a much finer estimate once we uh, once we establish the flow rate. And yesterday you <coughs> talked about the um, cleanup lasting well into the fall. Can you elaborate on what you sure. meant there? Because you can't expect it all to actually be cleaned up in the fall. Well, I think we need to be realistic and honest and transparent with the American people. You know, when the relief well is finished and it's capped sometime in August, oil will have flowed to the surface in some manner because we probably won't get 100% contained. We want as much as we can get. So this will still be oil on the surface the day the well is capped. And the question is, that will have to be dealt with. And there will be long-term environmental issues associated with where the oil has come ashore. We're going to have to conduct natural resource damage assessments so we can understand the long-term uh, issues associated with that and what uh, BP should be held accountable for as far as correcting those environmental problems. If you look at all of that, we'll be dealing with oil or the effects of oil well after the time the well is capped. Well, it depends on how much oil is up there and, and, again, the direction and the currents and so forth. But I think there needs to be a, an expectation that we're going to be working the, at least four to six weeks after uh, that, that, that uh, well is capped on the oil that's just presently overhead. And that doesn't account for what oil might come ashore. It will elude us, so we'll have to deal with as far as the impact in the marshes. Sounds like you're capturing more. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. Mutiny. Great. Well, okay. Just, you're going yeah. in the regular yeah. room. Yeah. Okay. We have facilitated here. Um, how would you characterize the the containment process so far? Have there been any signs of setbacks or progress? And then on the same thing, can you say how many total miles of coastline have been soiled by oil so far? Sure. Uh, on the containment process, I think it's going uh, fairly well. This is a condition-based process. Well, they, they increase production once they establish that. They're always concerned about the formation of hydrates. They're putting methanol down. They're also warming the oil as it comes up. All that's kind of being balanced, and I think uh, I think it's I think it's going fairly well. What we want is to establish a rate so we know exactly uh, what that containment cap can tolerate in terms of flow and what's going to be lost. And I think it's very very important, and we're watching that uh, very very closely. Uh, as far as the coastline, I think we have about 120 miles total linear uh, that's been impacted. But I would say that's kind of deceiving because I was talking with the parish presidents and Governor Jindal. Uh, you can have one mile impacted linearly, and that could go very deep as far as the acreage of the marshlands behind it. So I think we need to understand where it comes ashore in a marshland, there is a depth uh, component to this, and uh, the effect could be far greater than that. Yes, sir. 
You say you're in contact with the White House every day, that you're getting everything you need. There are people down in the Gulf, though, that say there aren't enough skimmers, there aren't enough people on the beaches. Uh, are they just misinformed? And also, you mentioned optimizing production. I understand you want to get as much out of this, but there's an incentive for BP to pull that oil out. Should they have to forfeit that oil and that profit to disincentivize them from keeping that going? Uh, the reason they want to keep the production going is not what they may recoup out of that in terms of production. The reason you want that flow to continue is it alleviates pressure on the well bore. We did the top kill. We were able to force mud down the well bore to the point where we actually suppressed all the oil. But the minute they stopped pumping the mud, the oil came back up. The reason they didn't go any further is they don't not, do not know the condition of the well bore and the casings down there. And if you exert pressure on that, you wouldn't want to force oil out into the formation or the strata and have it come up through the seafloor. So you want it, you want to produce the oil for safety and containment reasons. I understand. Should they have to forfeit that oil? And what uh, about the skimmer? That's above my foot right now. Let's be clear. Uh, they are the responsible party. They are going to bear the cost for uh, exactly what the admiral is describing. I think those costs are likely to greatly exceed uh, what the oil that is recouped uh, is sold for on the market. Uh, I, I, they're in for uh, on response and recovery. There'll be penalties that will be involved in this uh, uh, in the many billions of dollars. Back to the skimmers. What, people are asking, where are the skimmers? Yeah, well, we're doing a national inventory right now because as the, uh, the, the response has evolved, as I told you, skimmers are now uh, the, the, the quantity and demand, and we're looking at that right now doing a national inventory. We may have to make a decision at some point to move skimmers from some part of the United States and basically accept the risk if there's an event there to be able to bring them here, and we're having that discussion right now. Have you waited too long to do that? Six weeks in? No, the, the threat's evolved. We had a lot of skimmers. We have a lot of skimmers down there. The question is we now know that we can take advantage of these vessels of opportunity if we get more. We didn't have the vessels of opportunity several weeks ago. We have them now. Admiral, uh, NOAA and the University of South Florida have been doing water samples underwater to see if there are underwater oil plumes. What do we know about that in terms of the existence of these big oil plumes and whether or not they'll come to the surface. Yeah, what we know is they, they found densities uh, below the surface, and the question is, uh, of those dense masses they found, uh, how much hydrocarbons or oil is there? Uh, we've had a couple of cruises that came up with some of that data. What, uh, what Jane Lopchenko has done, she's dispatched a fleet of NOAA ships, and one of them is out actually right around the platform th themselves. I was out there last week, and there was a NOAA vessel taking uh, water samples. And what they're doing is they're taking water samples at different depths try and establish the amount of hydrocarbons that are in them at a particular depth. Uh, and she wants to make a model of the entire Gulf to find out, because if you go down, there's, there's a density there. You can go back the next day, and it may not be there because it moves around. What she's trying to create is a model of the entire Gulf. Uh, it's kind of like filling in the pixels on a screen with uh, data samples that go down through the water column uh, to try and measure how, what the hydrocarbons are there. That is in, that's happening right now. That will ultimately have to be put into a computer and come up with a data model for the, for the coast. But that's what's going on. Do you know if there are big, large oil plumes underwater yet, or that has not been? It hasn't been established by testing. We understand there are, dense, uh, there's, there, there are densities down there, uh, but as she would say, they haven't been characterized yet, and that's the reason they're doing the sampling right now and testing it. And, and then also there are conflicting reports whether or not there are birds that are covered in oil from Texas, as far as Texas. Is that true or not? Uh, I haven't got that report, but we'll certainly follow up and get it back to you on that. I am personally haven't been given a report on Texas. Um, following up on the issue of, uh, of your saying over the weekend that it would take the cleanup could take months, I've talked to environmental groups this morning who say that that's a pipe dream. They believe that based on the Exxon Valdez situation, it's going to be a minimum of three, four, five years, maybe much more than that, that this cleanup operation is going to be going on in a major way. Do you simply yeah. disagree with that? No, no, I don't. I, maybe it's how we're characterizing it. Uh, the, uh, the dealing with the, the oil spill on the surface is going to go on for a couple of months. After that, it'll be taken care of. I agree with you. Long-term issues of restoring the environment and the habitats and stuff will be a, will be years. I was I, I've separated out two different functions, I guess. Here, yeah. Exxon Valdez, it's been. Yeah, I have no decades. argument with I have no argument with that characterization. One other thing: when we were down there this week uh, with the president, uh, we want, we wanted to get shots of work crews on the beaches, and there apparently are rules that they can only work 20 minutes in every hour, and we cruised to, uh, down the beach uh, past six different tenths of people. We could not get a shot of anybody working in the hour or so we were on the beach, and I know people. In Grand Isle are irate because they say, look, let us go out and do it. Why do you have all these rules and all this bureaucracy? 
would you oppose people or is there any kind of mechanism that could be used to let people who are really fired up to clean sure. this up because they live there and let them do it? You know, we have a program where we, uh, it's called uh, Qualified Community Responders, where we bring them in and we, and we teach them to do certain tasks. And it could be driving the vehicles up and down the beach, some, some basic training on raking and removing debris and those sort of things. And in a number of states, we've actually trained these folks and put them out to work there. Uh, I don't know about the particulars of your particular situation, but that's, that certainly is available. Are you aware of this? Is there really, a, as we were told, a 20-minute limit in each hour that they can work? Uh, I'm not familiar personally, but uh, we will get the information to follow okay. up with it. Thanks. I mean, obviously, Chip, anybody that deals with and comes in contact with this substance, there's, right. as the Admiral said, there's a training program uh, that is involved in, and we're taking uh, worker health extremely seriously. We don't want to find as you said, months, weeks, weeks, months, or years later, um, that we didn't put enough safeguard in on the front end to ensure the health of those um, that have either been contracted or want to volunteer to help uh, at the beaches. We've actually got an agreement with the Department of Labor and OSHA on how we're going to use their protocols and make sure that they're fully integrated into our response as well. So as I understand it, the uh, containment cap is now putting out more oil than the ship above it is able to carry. You mentioned that BP is going to bring another ship in. Why is the company just doing that now? Why does it seem like we're always just one step behind here? Well, they're not, a, they're not at a production rate yet that will tax. They, they potentially could be there. As, as, they're, as they're spooling it up, there's going to be a second vessel brought Isn't in. Isn't that why they didn't close that fourth valve? Because they didn't want to get to a they rate? They are not to the full couldn't. rate yet, is, is my understanding. There's also, as I understand it also, there are uh, as you said, there is concern about hydrates. There's concern about pressure. Uh, this is a delicate cap, and uh, we want to ramp this thing up so that uh, uh, this is uh, a solution that we can work with for weeks and months, and don't uh, don't do something too rapidly to cause uh, something uh, tragic to happen. I would tell you several uh, uh, several weeks ago they started converting a much larger production platform in anticipation that they would replace this one with a higher capacity platform. That's being done right now, but it's a very large, large ship, and some of these are coming as far away as the North Sea to actually bring in the type of production platforms that are floating uh, that could do this at a much larger rate, and that had already been in progress. Bottom line, BP has consistently underestimated the amount of the flow, the flow rate. The U.S. government doesn't seem to know it. Why is this so difficult? Uh, Frankly, BP is not, not doing any estimates on flow rate. We've established our own group, and we do that now, and it's independent of British Petroleum. Those, those estimates I gave you are estimates that we are doing. We, that's, I mean, they can do it if they want, but I think we need to have the American people understand that any flow rates that are being developed under any models, those are governmental with third parties involved, not BP, and that's what's happening. Well, I think there's a lot of talk about transparency. I think uh, you guys need to be assured that we are doing this, and we are. Well, not to mention, as we've talked about here, Chip, the amount of oil that leaks will help determine the fine that BP incurs. So while our interests align on capping this well, uh, we would never uh, ask BP to tell us how much oil they think is leaked in order for us to determine the compensation and penalty that is to be derived from it. <laughs> Understanding that, again, the flow rate technical group was, uh, was stood up, and as Admiral Allen has said countless number of times, our response was not dictated upon uh, a flow mechanism. But the flow rate technical group was set up and because we had a we had a, hold on we had a we had a better idea and could use better equipment, NASA equipment, equipment from all over the government to get as best an estimate as we could for an event that is happening five thousand feet below the surface of the water. Somebody the analogy that somebody used to me was it, it is we are trying to measure five thousand feet below the surface the amount of uh, material that is coming up if you were to shake a Coke can. Now, that's not a perfect analogy because most Coke cans are 12 ounces and you know the amount. So the flow rate technical group is going back and looking at uh, the information that we have now, the information post the shear cut, uh, and whether or not, as the Admiral said, we can get a closer range as to what has happened. And there was a time when you guys were saying a lot that the flow rate wasn't essential because you were planning for the worst case scenario. But there's now a couple well, of examples. Said that where, always and, and, right. and that's but, always it, but it is relevant, no, right? I, I mean, to how much you're able exactly. to capture, no, you're whether point. top kill is going at, to be. At effective. one point in the response, we said, okay, 
it's time to get a better estimate on that because ultimately we have to know the entire amount of oil that was discharged, not only for the purposes of what falls on in terms of accountability of BP, but able to assess the overall environmental impact of exactly how much oil is out there. So you're absolutely right. But in the, in, in the beginning, it wasn't quite as required t in terms of timeliness, but is required has to be done, and that's the reason we're doing it. Yeah. Laura. Do you question whether BP has the resources available to bring to this problem that they said they would have when they filed their application for the drilling permit? Are you talking about the, the drilling permit for uh, the original well? Mm -hmm. uh, we have far exceeded the assets being brought to this problem that were indicated in there. You're talking about their spill response plan? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we far exceeded that now because of the breadth of this thing. It's from Louisiana clear to Port St. Joe, Florida. So the actual resources out there are far beyond what they identified in their plan. The, the, does BP have, is BP, to BP is brought all that they said they would and Yes, more. yeah, the resources, the resources identified in their plan were all brought to bear. Yeah, that's correct. correct. And is there anything right now that BP is not doing that you would like to see them be doing? We'd like them to get better at claims. And there are two issues with claims. One is just the timeliness for the individuals. Uh, now, they've done, they made some things fairly easy. If you show up and you have a W-2 form or any kind of, uh, of uh, evidence of employment, uh, they're starting to make partial claim and payments. Uh, we need to get that routinized so every month they can look forward to that check coming in. And uh, 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 we have uh, somebody on my staff that's actually meeting with uh, BP today. There's a second larger issue that the uh, local leaders identified to the president in the last couple of weeks, and actually Governor Riley in Alabama indicated to me on Saturday, and that's businesses putting claims in uh, for their inability to operate seafood manufacturing plants and so forth. That, those, are, uh, uh, those claims are processed in a different way and require different documentation that requires information about the business themselves. That appears that may be a little cumbersome right now, so we're actually going to have a meeting with Br British Petroleum this week and try and simplify the, the, their ability to actually handle the claims from businesses. So in that regard, uh, they don't have a history in that, uh, of that company of doing that type of work. They brought in contractors and claims adjusters that are working with them, but we think they need to do that better and quicker. And I would say this. We, we heard this, as, as uh, the Admiral said, uh, uh, on, on Friday, both with elected officials uh, and when we met with fishermen, we met with seafood processors uh, who, um, who are going through this process. We have, we've set up, uh, as we talked about on Friday, um, if you go to disasterassistance.gov, uh, there's a pretty large icon for people to go to uh, if they are having difficulty getting their claims adjudicated by BP. Uh, there's an official that is set up through FEMA that works uh, directly with uh, the National Incident Commander uh, to ensure that this process is moving along as expeditiously as it needs to. Uh, we've got problems with, as the Admiral said, major claims uh, being paid uh, and uh, different uh, different things along the route. A, a seafood processor said, you know, we, um, when we catch our shrimp, we freeze the shrimp and they're processed. So while their processor may not be seeing a, a lessening in the output based on what they had caught previous to this, obviously because a huge portion of the Gulf is closed to commercial fishing, more shrimp is not coming in, right? So that back end of that process is ending while if you just simply looked at the business, the sheer output would not necessarily look different. So those are things that we're asking uh, BP to work through. It's something that the president. I think the best about. example of uh, the president and I were down and we met with local leaders and, and, and had some uh, lunch with them. Is a marina operator, uh, having having maybe 10 percent of the boats tied up at the marina than they would normally this time of year, and all the associated uh, uh, support for that, you know, food and. Uh, local businesses being used for, for meals and all that kind of stuff. That, that is very, very complex, but we got to get to the bottom of this and make sure these folks can have access to the claims process. And even in the economic food chain of the Gulf, essentially eligible for reimbursement, if, you're, if you operate a B&B &B that do, doesn't have people coming, if you supply food to the B&B &B that doesn't have people coming, I mean, is it all the way down? You're, you're asking some questions that we never had to answer in, in the context of an oil spill or one this large, and that's, those are the types of things we're working through this week. Tracy Waring. Uh, from FEMA is actually we've actually brought her over here uh, with us on the National Incident Command staff and she's coordinated that for us. And we'll have some more, for, we're, we're, we're delving into that this week. You said that when the second platform arrives that they'll be able to contain about 20,000 barrels of oil? Pro produce about 20,000 barrels, yeah. So does that mean that when you look at your, the two models that you're expecting that it's going to be closer to the 25 
thousand barrels of oil. We just know that's their capacity. We still haven't established what the flow rate is. That that is the big unknown that we're trying to hone in and get the exact numbers on. So that the flow rate could end up being higher than twenty five thousand. If that's the case, then we're going to be dealing with uh, the, the residual oil until we get the larger production platform that I talked about earlier. Twenty five this year, right? Which, 25 was before this year, which right. could have increased it another 20%. Could have, yes. Could have, could have, yes. Could have, yes. The, exactly. flow rate, the flow rate group is, is, as I understand it, going through uh, the larger flow rate as well as uh, um, trying to hone in on what we think we might have seen in terms of increased capacity after this year cut. And we'll make those numbers known as we get them. Uh, we're not trying to lowball it or highball it. It is what it is, and we need to tell you that. Because at most, you'd be able to produce 20,000 barrels of oil per day it, once it, the it, second platform. Correct, and then that's anticipated to be replaced by a larger production capacity platform in several weeks. Okay. Um, and then how many times, how often do you speak to Tony Hayward? As often as I need to, either Tony Hayward or Bob Dudley. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, they're, they're in different places, in different locations, but I, I, I would say daily and maybe multiple times during the day if I need to. And have you brought up the claims issues yes. with either of them directly? Yes, I did. And what, have, what has been their response? They're saying uh, they're looking for any type of input direction that we will give them because they obviously want to do this right. It's, it's not a core competency of BP, so we need to give them some help and some direction and guidance, and that's what we're doing. And the meeting that you're having this week, will that be with Tony Hayward? No, be with the person that runs our claims processing for BP. Okay. And if I need to meet with Tony Hayward after that, we'll do that. Be myself, Tracy Waring, and their claims processor. When you speak to Tony Hayward or Mr. Dudley, do you trust the information that they're giving you? I get this question all the time. I'm not sure it's so matter a matter of trust. You know, we're, we're working together. It has to be cooperative. We're trying to create unity of effort. Uh, if I ask them for information, I get it. Uh, if, if I think I need more information, I go back and ask them if there's an ambiguity or something needs to be clarified, I go back and I do that. I have given them direction sometimes saying we're not going to go forward until you give me this. Uh, it's an ongoing constant dialogue. You can call it partnering, cooperation, trust, whatever, but that's the way it works. And, and we're asking for, and, and we'll be asking for at this meeting, some greater transparency on this claims process, uh, trying to shorten the window for uh, what BP is legally required to do in filling those claims. But in having uh, a, a, a broader understanding uh, through transparency about what uh, what has yet to be fulfilled, there are some complicating factors. We are dealing with uh, personal, uh, personally identifiable information, so there are privacy issues and, and data associated with the folks who are filing claims and how you actually manage this process. We just to make sure we get it right. Major, three issues. Admiral, one dispersants. Can you catch the nation up on what we've used so far? Are you still using them? What's the environmental? feel you have for them now as this continues. Secondly, on the sand berms in Louisiana, where are they? Are they, is one halfway constructed? Do you have two up or what, where, where are we in that process? And are they being contemplated anywhere else along the possible spill target areas as the uh, spill continues? And lastly, you said on one of the shows yesterday that you would look into this issue whether or not BP withheld or ordered you to withhold video early on in the disaster from, from public release. Do you have any? Uh, yeah, I think we issued a statement on that. I, I, I don't think there was any indication that we did do that. Uh, I, and my, my press assistant can make it a, make it available to you. If you go back, I forgot the first question now. <laughs> Dispersants, good. Uh, Dispersants, as you know, we recently uh, breached the one million gallon uh, threshold, uh, not a threshold of any particular importance other than its sheer magnitude. Never before. Uh, never, never before, never before. Uh, I've had frequent contact uh, with Lisa Jackson on this. And the overall approach is to minimize the amount of uh, dispersants being used on the surface because they're not as effective as the dispersants used in the subsea area. And the reason they're not as effective is they go on top of the oil and you get less effect because there's oil, if, if the oil is several inches deep, the dispersants kind of react on the top. And you actually need to kind of mix it up and emulsify it for the dispersants to have the greatest effect. When we apply dispersants with a wand at the point of discharge, there's a better mixing all, all, already. So we're much more effective at a much lower rate. So our general strategy is to use subsea dispersants wherever possible and minimize the amount on the surface to what's needed for safety or, or exigent circumstances. And I'll give you one. Um, if, if you saw, we did some video out on the, uh, on the oil rigs last week when I was out there. In the background, one of the offshore supply vessels was actually spraying water all around the uh, Discover Enterprise. That was put down volatile organic compounds that were coming up out of the oil that was sitting around the ship that was actually producing. Uh, there actually is a, a, a threat to personal safety and health there on those vapors. Dispersants put those down. You'd rather use water to do it. There may be times where, because of the situation, you may want to use dispersants to reduce those, uh, those, those uh, vapors. But those are the types of things we would talk about. 
Uh, they give us a dispersant plan, and uh, EPA is aware of that. Our federal on-scene coordinator is trying to minimize dispersants on the service, but there may be times that they're going to use it, but we need to use those in very judicious quantities. That means we're going to be relying on in-situ burning and mechanical skimming in and around the wellhead. And sand berms. Sand berms. Uh, at this point, uh, the president made the decision last week. Uh, we authorized the six segments uh, that were permitted by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, the state of Louisiana is working with British Petroleum. I understand they've got the funding mechanisms in place. I think the real issue right now is availability of barges. There are a couple of barges that are starting to work right away, and I, I can, I can uh, verify this for you, but I believe the first place they're going to start working is somewhere around the Chandelier Islands because the sand source is close enough where they can get to work right away. When you go to the west of the Mississippi River, they're actually going to have to take sand from offshore, actually deposit it on the seabed, and then, re then retransmit it to make the berms on the islands. That's a much longer process. I've talked with Lieutenant General Van Antwerp, head of the Corps of Engineers, about their ability uh, to free up dredges from other projects to be able to help them. Uh, the state of Louisiana is also looking nationally at, 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 uh, at dredge capability, and right now it's a matter of finding the dredge capacity. Uh, to be able to start uh, doing some work, but they're ultimately going to have to take a lot of sand, move it in close to shore, and then move it again. Uh, t if, they, if they come up against a uh, capacity problem in dredges, uh, we can do something called a waiver of the Jones Act, which allows us to bring foreign flag dredges in, but that would be, uh, I would consider that only as a uh, last uh, gap filler that might be needed. We're, I don't think we're there yet, and Louisa has not come and told me that yet. Just so I think you're aware, and if I'm not mistaken, each night the Joint Information Center's fact sheet contains an updated number uh, in the amount of surface and subsea dispersants uh, used, uh, so people uh, should be able to track each day how much is there. Uh, on the claims process, um, what role is the government playing or could the government be playing in going in there and actually managing it for and with BP? And also I want to ask you on royalties, is BP committed to paying federal royalties um, as far as you're concerned on the oil that's collected? Uh, I'm not sure on the royalty issue. L uh, let me check on that. Yeah. Uh, on the claims process, what we're trying to do is create uh, independent government teams for every state, facilitate them, the state getting together with the BP claims process, identify problems, and move ahead. Uh, there's actually a fairly novel uh, idea being approached in Alabama right now, and that's uh, training National Guardsmen to go out and assist folks in filing claims. So you actually kind of have a multiplier effect. Uh, and that's being discussed actually today between Tracy Waring and the, the folks in Alabama. So uh, we will have teams in every state that are able to do that. The question is, we want to get out to these folks. Uh, I had some anecdotal evidence. There's some folks who are just sitting back because they just think it's not going to work. It's too much trouble. Well, we, those folks got to know they come forward, put these claims in, they're going to get they're going to get paid. And we need to help them understand that and how to do it. Sure. Thank you, Admiral. Um, over the weekend, Tony Hayward said that BP clearly was not prepared for a spill of this magnitude. The Coast Guard is the frontline agency in responding to oil spills. So what about the Coast Guard? Did you discount the possibility of a major blowout in the Gulf? No, we, 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 we had always anticipated that could happen. In fact, in, the, in April of 2002, we actually ran an exercise on the Louisiana offshore oil, oil port, which is only about 90 miles to the west of where this happened, and we envisioned a, a total loss of the wellhead for a number of days. Uh, it almost was a similar type of an event, except it was in much shallower water. Uh, in that national exercise, I was the national incident commander in the drill. We ran it out of the Superdome. Uh, and so we have known about these and planned for them. What's made this one anomalous is the amount of area this oil is covering and the breadth uh, from uh, central Louisiana clear over to, at this point, Port St. Joe, potentially Florida. I don't think any plan ever envisioned it would get out that far and disaggregate and have, us, uh, have the requirement to have so many resources spread across such a wide area, because you kind of think of an oil slick coming in in mass when you think about the Exxon Valdez. That is what's been different, and that, if, if anything, is taxing our resources. It's the breadth and the complexity and the disaggregation of the oil, which I don't think it was accounted for, anticipated in any plans. Any reason why that wasn't anticipated? Just Never happened before, no engineers could What you usually do in a response plan, you, you, you come up with a worst case discharge or some amount that you plan against, and you identify the resources that can be brought to the scene in terms of skimming, booming sensitive areas that are nearby, in situ burning, and so forth. And those were all identified. But if you have to, if you have to replicate that across the entire Gulf, if you, you start multiplying the resource requirements. And that's something we probably need to look at as, we, as the commission takes a look at the response. I don't think it was any kind of lack of duty or anything like that. I think it was a, a peculiar set of circumstances that, frankly, weren't anticipated, and I think are going to have to be anticipated in the future. And look, I, I, we've said this before. I think the last time you saw um, 
a spill of this magnitude in the Gulf was off the coast of Mexico in 1979. And uh, the, the President has asked the Commission and the Department of Interior, as it looks through the regulatory framework of this, to ensure that um, we're taking uh, all precautions and all possible scenarios into account. Uh, as uh, I think it's probably safe to say, if something doesn't happen since 1979, you begin to take your eye off of that. I, th I think I, I think we need to be totally transparent, learn as much as we can from this thing, and I think I think everybody everybody's on board with that. If, if there's something we, we 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 could do better in the future and change our response plan, we certainly need to do that. Mark, well, I'd like to ask you personally. I mean, you've really become the face of this spill over the past week and a half. I can't imagine that's how you expected to end your career. <laughs> <laughs> I told somebody I'm failing to get fired. <laughs> uh, I, well, yeah, w I didn't anticipate this would happen in my career, but uh, uh, I'm honored to have been asked to do this. It's not a very easy job. It's very complex. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with personally. Uh, but clearly, clearly, uh, we need unity of effort, and that has to happen some way. What makes this spill very different, by the way, and I hear a lot of talk, well, let's bring DOD in and things like that. Uh, when you have a military operation, you're operating under what we call Title 10 of the U.S. Code, and there's a monolithic chain of command from the lowest soldier, sailor, or coast guard, and then clear to the president. Uh, in this one, we have a lot of different cabinet departments with uh, roles and responsibilities and missions are required to conduct out there. And the real goal in this type of an environment, in any incident that takes place outside DOD, is unity of effort, not unity of command. And that's what we're trying to achieve here because there are a lot of stakeholders, a lot of people have responsibilities. Good example is a shared responsibility between Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA. Fish and Wildlife Service has marine mammals and endangered species. NOAA is responsible for commercial fisheries and National Marine Fisheries Service. Well, they both have equities out there in the Gulf, and the question is, how do you create that unity of effort? And that's that's a real challenge. <clears throat> All your your public responsibilities of doing briefings such as this, do they take away from the incident commander part of it? Well, this is always a very valuable practice. <laughs> 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 sort of a softball, Mark, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and. <laughs> uh, on, on the skimming and the shoreline, you say that a boom isn't uh, a silver bullet. Where are the, how many skimmers are actually out there now close enough to shore to be doing some good? And uh, are there really no other higher tech uh, techniques to, uh, to protect the shoreline other than the booms? Are there new technologies you, that haven't been tried in past spills? Well, we actually have a separate team that's looking at alternative technologies, and we get requested to take a look at them. We're actually evaluating some of those. Uh, there are very different types of skimming capability. Uh, and uh, some of them are effective in different parts of the water. The question is getting the right skimmer for the oil that you want to recover in the depth of water and where it's at. Uh, big ocean skimming systems are much different than what you do in five or six feet in the back bay. And you have, you have some types of skimming systems that actually are drums, and the oil sticks to it, and they roll up, and then it's scraped off, and they continue to capture it in a, in a, uh, in a containment device. There are some uh, systems where they'll have a boom with a pocket at the end. You carry the oil, and you evacuate it out. Uh, there are some systems that actually uh, uh, will take a circle and drop it just below the surface of the water and have the oil kind of flow into it almost like a drain, recover it and pump it out. And so there's a lot of stuff out there. What we have to do is match the type of skimmer, the quantity of skimmers, uh, with the vessels we've got. And that's how this, the, the uh, characterization of this response has changed, and we're, and we're having to adapt with it. And, that, and that's been hard to get, to get in close enough to protect the Yeah, I think ultimately what we're, the, the best thing we need to do is probably get these vessels of opportunity because these are watermen that know the local areas. They have boats with the right draft that can operate there and then match the right skimmer to them. And that's, that's, the, that's the process that we're going through right now. All right. You mentioned that the vessels of opportunity were not on hand until recently. The additional platform is still on its way to the site. The systems for compensation are still being set up and finalized. Can you address the perception that, as Savannah put it, the response has just consistently been a couple steps behind the problem. Well, I think we're, we're, we're adapting to an enemy that changes. Uh, the nature of this oil spill has changed continually since day one. We had a lot of oil in one spot to begin with based on the currents and the wind. We, this has all been disaggregated and as the spill has changed, our response has had to change. Uh, the, uh, for instance, you know, oil or hurricanes or any weather are agnostic to, to boundaries between states. All of our uh, response organization and structure is by states and our captain of port zones. And so the difference between the incident command in home and the incident command in Mobile is actually a division of labor that is the uh, Pearl River that divides Louisiana and Mississippi. That, and when you start talking about one of these things, it's an artificial boundary. So we have to learn how to adapt. And as this thing gets broad and goes across different jurisdictions and authorities, then we have to change our command and control structure and we have to adapt to it. 
uh, and then you can say there's a latency period there and where we slow to react, you could say that, but I think we're trying to adapt and learn from a spill that's never happened before in this country. <clears throat> I have two oil questions. I have one non-oil question. Are you taking those now, Robert, or after? Uh, we can take them now. All right. Uh, first, um, you said over the weekend on this week that, uh, that you've issued an order that uh, journalists are going to have unfettered access to, to the disaster sites. What I want to know is, uh, what's going to happen? To BP, what are you going to do to BP for preventing journalists from from getting access to these sites, both prior to now and going forward? Well, if we have to, we can issue an administrative order from the federal on-scene coordinator if they violate their civil and criminal statutes associated with it. But we we haven't issued an order like that. I put out a general guidance that there are only two reasons that that, that uh, media should be prohibited from an area, if it's a security reason or a safety reason because of personal protective equipment. Other than that, uh, we are putting no restrictions on ac ac access. Now, we can't tell somebody to talk to somebody they don't want to, but my policy is uh, unless it's a security or safety reason, there is no restriction on access. Is that, is that system really nimble enough? I mean, you know, if BP calculates that keeping journalists away from oily birds is more viable than, than whatever your penalty is going to be down the road, how well, I guess somebody would have to give me the specific. I guess somebody would have to give me the specific of an incident. We'll go take a look okay, at I it. I want to take a picture of an oily bird, and they told me to go away. Uh, well, it's hypothetical. If you give me the facts, I'll react to them and tell you what we would do or can do. Usually, yeah. people would be under the impression they can't talk if, you're, if you talk to them down there. They're not permitted. Well, we'll follow up with. I'll, I'll have a call with Tony Hayward. Second question. Um, yeah. Director James Cameron says he offered to help uh, film the uh, the site, the disaster site, and was, BP told him no. And uh, what he says is that, uh, you know, currently the, the video stream we have, the only video we have, images of the actual leak, are controlled by what he characterizes as the criminals. Doesn't he have a point that, that maybe it's worth some risk to have someone other than BP providing images of that leak? I know he met. I know he met with Lisa Jackson and some of our folks were in the room. I, I would just make this observation, and I haven't talked to Mr. Cameron myself. <clears throat> All the video that's coming out of that operation right now from the remotely operated vehicles is available. Okay, uh, and we've uh, we made that available. Actually, there was some concern when we started the top kill process that it might put too much pressure on the operators, and BP actually wanted to have a delayed broadcast uh, to remove that risk in the in the control room. And it was decided uh, after a conversation between myself and Tony Hayward that the need for transparency overwhelmed whatever additional risk might be uh, created by that. So the other thing you have to understand is they're conducting what they would call sim ops. Uh, that's what the industry would call sim simultaneous operations uh, within about a one square mile area around that wellhead uh, and the riser pipe and everything else at any particular time you could have between 14 and 20 ROVs operating down there. The need to deconflict those for safety reasons is a valid one. We were using the riser insertion tool, tool. You, if you remember when we started that they had to stop and reinsert it. The reason they had to do that was the ROVs that were doing the subsea dispersant application the ROVs that were working the insertion tube actually bumped into each other and it caused the tube to be dislodged and they had to do it again. So there's an issue about density and the amount of ROVs you can bring down there. And I appreciate uh, Mr. Cameron's comments, uh, but I believe uh, trying to put one more ROV down there uh, might actually increase the risk to the operation, and there are a number of ROVs operating down there. Robert, um, off the subject of the oil, does the President have any reaction to the controversy over uh, Helen's remarks that were publicized Friday? Well, uh, uh, I've not spoken with him directly on that. I would say this. Uh, Tommy, I think um, uh, those remarks were offensive and reprehensible. Uh, I think uh, she should and has apologized um, because uh, I, I, obviously those remarks um, are do not reflect uh, certainly the opinion of uh, I assume most of the people in here, uh, and uh, certainly not of the administration. Admiral, on the question of disaggregation, which I think means breaking up. Yes. I assume that <laughs> I should have should should used simple sailor talk. <laughs> <laughs> not, not too simple. Not too <laughs> family broadcast, sir. It's a. Uh, yes, yeah. that, that, does that make it more difficult? Does that make yes. it more difficult? Well, yes and no. It makes it more difficult, but when it comes to shore, it's not in a mass at a point where you have a huge impact in one place. So, And I wouldn't even say it's a silver lining because there's oil on the water, nothing but bad happens. But it does lessen the impact where it does come ashore because it's not coming ashore in mass, but it's coming ashore in a lot of different places. Yeah, you mentioned, I think, hundreds of it's, it, it's increasing the vastly the complexity of the response. Yeah. Is, and is it naturally occurring, or do this person say to that? Uh, it's all of the above. Uh, when it came to the surface, it, there might have been in situ burning going on, there might have been mechanical skimming, there might have been dispersants being deployed. 
the next day the wind may have shifted so you have one some oil went this way the next day some oil went that way you have uh, currents moving it around tidal currents as well so depending on when the oil came to the surface under what environmental conditions could have uh, created a small batch of oil and moved it one direction then another one another direction and that's what we're dealing with it's not a monolithic spill on balance is the use of dispersants uh, worthwhile even though it, it, it breaks this up and makes it harder to skim or, or stop uh, in different places I believe they're worthwhile but I think there's enough concern as we approach the million gallon mark and I think specifically uh, from Lisa Jackson and and Jane Lepchenko regarding the unknown implications of that amount of dispersants that uh, out, of, out of caution even though we may need it from time to time, say, to suppress volatile organic compounds, we need to have a minimum amount of dispersants we're using and only when it's the most appropriate and we need to use them to achieve a particular effect and then focus all of our dispersant application at the site of the leak. Steve, the yeah. have used that much? Right. Well, actually, we have. We have suppressed them on the surface. Yes. Well, and the, the directive that went uh, for a much greater uh, reduction in the volume, uh, I think, has now been, been now several weeks old. Stephen? Given the delicacy of this containment cap solution, are you confident that it will remain effective uh, during the months it will take to uh, dig the relief wells? And what kind of maintenance, et cetera, needs to be done down there? And would there ever, would a scenario ever arise where it might be, uh, you might have to stop producing the oil to fix or upgrade or whatever the solution down there? I don't think we should ever be comfortable with the containment operation. Uh, we ought to be watching it very, very closely. Uh, we ought to be ruthless in our oversight of BP and trying to understand what oil is not being contained that's leaking out around that rubber seal once we know what that flow rate is. And we need to understand completely that if, if we have a severe weather in the form of a hurricane, there may be times where we're going to have to disconnect uh, that uh, operation and reestablishment. And during that time, we're going to have uh, oil coming to the surface again. That's the reason I've said this is a long campaign and we're going to be dealing with this oil for the foreseeable future. April. Several questions. Um, one, has BP or this government consulted with the British government on issues of resources and the British military in efforts to help? And if so, what what was said? Uh, I would say I have no contact with the British government government per se, but we have looked at foreign officers of assistance. Uh, we have taken boom and skimming capability from overseas and accepted that, and BP has made a number of purchases from overseas, especially the Middle East, where the type of uh, equipment we want is there actually bought it and flown it in. Uh, I'm working with our military to the extent that they can add value. Uh, we've had Canadian forces down that have actually uh, been flying some missions with their aircraft. Uh, and so there's, there's been a lot of international outreach, but nothing direct with the, with the British forces. I like that, the British, British government, especially since BP is based over there. Why not? Well, we can certainly reach out and contact them. We, 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 anybody that has anything to bring to the fight, we're considering. Uh, if, if it takes an ask, and uh, we'll do that. That's fine. I have no problem with that. And also on another question, you're talking about op optimizing production. Let's get into lessening waste. Um, is it cost effective to recycle some of the wasted oil that has been spilled? And um, how oh, would you go ahead? Yeah, almost all the recovered oil is recycled one way or another, with the exception. Uh, if it's contaminated uh, sand or debris, that actually in some cases be can become uh, uh, oily waste or hazardous waste has to be treated uh, in accordance with EPA guidelines. Uh, Lisa Jackson has gone out and really looked. We've actually been to a couple of facilities to make sure we know how they're handling the oily waste. And there are certain ways that it has to be disposed of properly in landfills or other places. And, and they're, those are following EPA guidelines. So marshland oil, things with maybe some reeds or... or yeah, when you have anything that's got oil on it, it, it becomes, uh, has, to, has, to be, has to be disposed of in accordance with, with federal law, just like uh, waste oil or hazmat would be. Yeah. And is it possible, it's not cost effective to even try to do that? To well, some of that disposal is done through incineration. There, there's some things they can do with, but in general, if, it, if the oil can be recycled or reused or reclaimed, that, that happens. But it gets to a point where it's just plain oily debris, then we dispose of that in accordance with federal guidelines. And EPA uh, is, is consulting with us and making sure those, those, those are uh, met with. In fact, when Lisa and I go out and visit the various sites, one of the things we look at are two things. Number one is waste disposal and how they're doing decontamination. Almost every forward operating base has a decontamination station, either for boom or individual boots or clothing where you go into this, it's all washed off, it's, 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 it's put into a tank, uh, the oil is decanted and then recycled. Let's do Sam and then we uh, should go to uh, this meeting. Just a quick question, can you discuss the benefits and the shortcomings going forward of actually requiring oil companies to drill relief wells simultaneously to the production of oil? Uh, and 
would that have helped uh, in the current situation had BP actually had that relief well up online even before the spill took place? Uh, I have not had that discussion. I think that would be a legitimate point to be raised and put in front of the commission as they do their work. Yeah. I would say that's a that's it would would fall under I think Sam the regulatory uh, framework that the commission will evaluate in order to um, uh, determine uh, the best way to operate this in a fail-safe atmosphere moving forward. Thanks, guys. Thank you.